Hi everyone. In this video I'm going to demonstrate weighted least squares regression using Stata and we're going to be relying on a fairly simple example entailing uh, a single independent variable and a single dependent variable. So briefly, weighted least squares regression is a potential strategy that you can uh, take in cases where you have evidence of a violation of homoscedasticity in the context of uh, ordinary least squares regression. So keep in mind that OLS regression makes the assumption that the variances of your residuals are constant across levels of your predictor variables or your predictor variable and that is referred to as homoscedasticity. So when you have a violation of that assumption, meaning that there's non-constant variance, then that's in a, a state referred to as heteroscedasticity. So the example that we're going to be using uh, is pivoting off of a presentation at this website. Um, at, uh, looks like it's hosted by Penn State and it, it looks to be a stat class, uh, stat 501. And uh, the instructor graciously provided this online and looks like uh, that uh, the instructor gave us some examples here to work from. So we're, we're actually going to be working from the first of these examples involving computer assisted learning. And just so you know, underneath the video description, I'm going, going to include a link to this website right here so you can read through the example a little bit more. Just keep in mind that the example that is provided um, has the analysis carried out using Minitab instead of Stata. So that's where we're sort of picking up from uh, in this particular presentation. Also, underneath the video description, I'm going to include a couple of links or a couple of additional links. One link is going to be to uh, a Stata data file that contains the data. So I've already imported it and uh, so you can download it and, and be able to follow along. And you'll also find a link to a do file that contains the code that I'll be reviewing in this presentation. So going back into Stata, uh, the basic uh, analysis that was carried out at that site uh, involved predicting this cost variable from number of responses. So what we'll do is go ahead and open up our do file editor and begin going through the code and what I've the way I've set it up is to sort of provide a general overview of the specifics behind running the analysis and then I'm going to show you a very easy way to generate your uh, least your uh, WLS regression results and I do want to mention too that uh, if you're not familiar with it you can uh, you can access do files you can actually create do files by going up to the do file editor and clicking on the icon and that's where you can type in your code and and run your analysis uh, without having to rely solely on the command window so I'm going to go ahead and open up that do file I was referring to and um, as you're looking at this, everything in green uh, basically represents comments. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to type in graph followed by two way. And then inside the parenthesis, we're going to indicate the type of graph that we are generating, which is going to be a scatter plot. So we're going to start off just by visualizing the relationship between our two variables. Then we'll run our regression analysis. We'll examine the residuals and then we, we will uh, carry out the uh, weighted least squares regression. So right now we're just going to be uh, taking a visualization of our um, uh, the relationship between our two variables. So I have scatter right here followed by cost which is my y variable uh, or my dependent variable in my regression followed by num of responses which is the x variable. You'll also notice in the next set of parentheses or the next uh, parentheses here we have L fit. Uh, so I'm going to be generating a line of best fit uh, for the scatter plot and then, and we have followed by the name of my y variable cost followed by num responses. So when I highlight all of this and click on execute selection you'll see I get my scatter plot and you can see that there's a pretty uh, good positive relationship between those two variables. So you'll see that basically as um, with a higher number of responses uh, goes higher cost with lower number of responses goes uh, lower cost. So we'll go ahead and perform our regression analysis using the regress command followed by the name of our dependent variable followed by the name of our independent variable. You'll also see on the next line I'm using the predict command and you'll notice that I've got R right here. This is going to be the name of, of the uh, residual variable that I'm going to be saving to the data set. So you'll see that following that I've got a comma and then following that I've got 
residuals and that is an option uh, associated with our predict command and that's to indicate that whatever this variable is that we've named we're going to be generating residuals for it. So I'll go ahead and highlight both of those and click on execute selection right here and so now that, res uh, that residual variable has been created so there it is right there and now what we want to do is to kind of study those residuals to see if we have any evidence of heteroscedasticity or non-constant variance. So we can study them by looking at the RVP plot right here um, where I basically am typing in RVP plot followed by the name of my predictor which is num responses followed by a comma and then this Y line uh, and followed by parenthesis with a zero in there. This is just to provide sort of a reference line so that the residuals we'll see uh, are um, sort of centered around zero um, so that we can visualize them a little bit better and get an idea about if there's any kind of evidence of any um, heteroscedastic pattern. You also see that down here I've got three uh, Bruce Pagan test versions that are available through uh, Stata. So the first one uh, is uh, just the standard uh, approach right here, and that's just by typing in estat, which is a post-estimation command, followed by het test. Then we have this version right here. This is the Coenker version, uh, where we have estat, het test, followed by a comma, and then iid. And this allows us to, to address limitations of that test above, you, um, where the normality assumption is not met, or, or, or basically is um, we're dropping that assumption. Then we also have another test. This is an F te F, F test version of that test. And again, that's, this, we also are dropping that normality assumption. So let's go ahead and just visualize the uh, relationship between our residuals and our uh, predictor variable num responses. So I'm going to highlight this and click on execute selection. And just kind of looking at this, uh, what we're looking for is any kind of evidence that the dispersion or spread of the residuals seems to be varying as we move from uh, from left to right within our graph. So you know, kind of looking at uh, lower values of the number responses, maybe there's a little bit less spread on this end right here. And then as we sort of move towards higher levels of uh, or higher values on that num responses, maybe it looks like we have a little bit more uh, spread that may be taking place. And what we're looking for, uh, if homoscedasticity is evident, is that um, that we have basically sort of um, uh, no evidence of any kind of pattern and in those cases where we have something uh, along this line maybe a fan shape pattern where we might have the residuals seem to uh, kind of uh, fan out in this kind of way right here that would be a situation where we would have evidence of heteroscedasticity. That's a fairly common uh, type of uh, pattern. We could also have a situation where uh, the low variability is on the, you know, is at the high end of our uh, predictor variable, and and higher variability is at the lower end. But in this uh, fan shape pattern right here, or, or seeming. Um, uh, pattern, um, it looks like that there might be greater dispersion at higher levels of our num responses variable. And just keep in mind, there are other uh, there are types of pat there are other uh, sorts of patterns that can be available, such as a butterfly pattern or a diamond shape pattern. Those are other types of heteroscedastic patterns that could be evident. But the fan shape or funnel uh, shape pattern is a fairly common one. Uh, so we're looking for any of those kinds of issues and. We can also then uh, utilize these three significance tests right here. So all of them basically assume that the null hypothesis, or the null hypothesis, basically assumes that we have evidence of constant variance. So if we have a viol uh, if we have statistical sig significance for um, a test, that's going to indicate that we are rejecting the null and uh, assuming that we have heteroscedasticity in our residuals. So I'll go ahead and highlight these and run them. Click on execute selection. And so we have all three test results that are given. So you can see right here this first test, the standard uh, or the original version, uh, this test result is not indicating statistical significance. So we would, uh, you know, in this case we're maintaining the uh, null of constant variance. But you'll notice that these other approaches right here, both of those significance tests are uh, indicating statistical significance, which means that we would be rejecting the null concerning constant variance and assuming then that we have uh, evidence of heteroscedasticity uh, taking place. So 
if we make the determination that we have heteroscedasticity, then we need to uh, rerun our analysis using WLS regression. And to run our analysis, we have to first generate a weight variable. So to do that, we're going to go down to our next line where I have gen, that's for uh, the command generate, and then I've got the name of my um, this uh, variable that's being created. So it's A, B, S, E, and th that's just an arbitrary name, but um, it says it's set equal to A, B, S, and inside the parenthesis here it says R, and that's the name of our original uh, variable denoting residuals in our data set. So we're taking the absolute value of the residuals and, and so we're creating this new variable uh, reflecting that. So if I highlight this and run it, then you can see that we have ABSE. So this is the absolute value uh, of our residuals. So that, that's that been saved to our data set. So at this point we we don't have our weight variable yet. There, you know, this is one of several steps uh, to generate our weight variable. So the next step is to perform a regression analysis where we're going to regress the absolute value of those residuals onto our predictor right here. So this is uh, actually going to be referred to as a standard deviation function because the absolute values of the residuals are uh, being serving as estimates of standard deviations for uh, residuals at different levels of our predictor. So this is a standard deviation function that we're generating. So following the uh, num responses variable, we have comma, and then I've got no constant. So that's the option for no constant. Um, and you can see I just, uh, it's uh, laid out as N-O-C-O-N-S-T. So when I highlight this and run it, we now have uh, generated results from that, and we're less interested in the results than we are in generating the fitted Ys from that particular uh, regression. So you'll see on the next line, I've got predict, and then followed by fit, comma, XB. So what we're doing in this case is we're creating a new variable that's called fit uh, that contains the fitted Y values from this uh, this regression analysis that we just computed. So that's why we have comma followed by the option XB. So when I highlight this and click on execute selection we now have our fitted Y values from this regression right here. And so we're using those to generate our weights. So finally uh, in terms of generating our weights, weights you can see I've got gen for generate. Uh, I've created, I'm creating a new variable that I'm just uh, calling weight, so that's again just kind of an arbitrary name. I've set that equal to 1 divided by fit raised to the power of 2, or fit squared. So you'll notice that I've got a backslash in here, so that's just 1 divided by fit squared. Um, so, uh, so that's basically all there is to it. So when I highlight all of this, click on execute selection, now I have the weight variable that has been added to my data set. And so from there, we can rerun our analysis uh, by using and using that weight variable to have now a weighted least squares regression. So you can see I'm rerunning my analysis where it says regress, cost, num responses as before. Then you can see I've got uh, two brackets, and inside those brackets, I've got a weight. So that's standing for analytic weight, and I've set that equal to the name of the weight variable that we generated up here. So when I do that, highlight all of that, and click on Execute Selection, now I have my weighted least squares regression results. So you can see this is my, uh, again, regression coefficient. There's my intercept, significance test right there. All of that's uh, given. And so you'll notice that those values are going to differ from uh, those that are given in, the weighted le in the, our uh, ordinary least squares regression that we uh, ran earlier. OK. so you can obviously see that that took a lot of work uh, in order to perform the weighted least squares regression and by the way we were just using one weighting scheme there are actually several different weighting schemes that we could uh, use so an easier approach is to utilize the package WLS0 and uh, the command associated with that package that we will be using is WLS0. So really quickly, if you haven't already installed it, you're going to need to install it to use this uh, command. So you'll see right here I've just typed in find it WLS0. And uh, when I highlight this and, and execute the selection, you can see that I get uh, a couple of options. 
Uh, this is the original uh, package right here. This is actually sort of a bit of a, a reworked version of the package that allows for, that kind of extends on the original one. But we're going to stick with the original one right here. So what I'll do is click on the link for that and click on uh, here to install in order to uh, install the package. And you'll notice that right now it just says all files already exist and are up to date. Uh, that's because I already had the package installed to Stata. So at this point now I can use the WLS0 option or command uh, associated with that package. So you'll notice that on this next line I've typed in WLS0 followed by the name of my dependent variable followed by the name of the independent variable uh, then a comma and then following that we have the option WVAR and that stands for weight variable. So inside the parenthesis here it says num responses so we're waiting based on uh, the number of responses variable as that's the variable that um, is associated with the heteroscedasticity um, and then you can see that we have type and then inside the parenthesis I have ABSE and that's really why I named this variable up here ABSE uh, that just stands for that's uh, pertaining to the type of weighting scheme being used which is uh, relying on the absolute value of our residuals then following that we have uh, the uh, no const option that's for no constant and then following that we have graph so we can actually graph out our residuals uh, very easily and uh, determine how well we solved our problem um, and so one of the nice things though with this package is that there are different uh, types of uh, weighting schemes available and so you could actually go through a set of those different approaches and graph those out and kind of get an idea about which one does the best job in terms of addressing that heteroscedasticity. But I'll go ahead and highlight this and click on execute selection and so now you can see that um, it, it's not quite as clear about there being heteroscedasticity. Um, it wasn't terribly uh, great before uh, and that typically is going to be the case when you're dealing with uh, smaller samples. It gets a little dicier to try to uh, identify those kinds of issues. But nevertheless it looks like they're fairly randomly dis displayed uh, but you can also see uh, that when we look at our results uh, from what we used earlier in terms of using the regress command with our analytic weights, there's our coefficients and our significance levels and everything in there is exactly the same as what we had just generated uh, right here. So you can see there's our regression slope and intercept. Those are the same values, our t values, p values, everything is again all the same. So as you can see, that was a much easier way uh, for us to perform that analysis than the, the steps that we took. But again, I just wanted to highlight uh, what was being done throughout the process. So the other approaches that you could take, um, you can see right here we have this uh, E2 as a type. And so in this particular case, that is uh, using a variance uh, function. So previously, when we were using the ABSE, we were using a standard deviation function. Uh, when we're using E2 as our type, we're uh, basically using a variance function. But uh, you can see everything else is exactly the same except for type. You can see right here uh, that we have the log of squared residuals um, that's being used in the weighting scheme. And then right here, we're using uh, the squared um, fitted values and actually that should have a two uh, in there. So let's just take a quick look at each of these. So I'm going to highlight this and run it and so there you go we have our um, our, uh, our weighted least squares regression again. You can see that when we move down to this next one right here we have our results that will be given uh, right here and again down here and so basically you know we all waited uh, you know we waited based on a single predictor so we're you know even though a few of the values might differ um, they're pretty much in this case are giving us uh, similar results but you can see a difference in terms of our output between here's our fitted um, value squared versus our uh, log uh, of the uh, squared residuals you can see the difference in terms of our coefficients that are given right here and then our coefficients that are given right here and, and so forth but nevertheless, you can generalize this to uh, multiple regression contexts as well. 
And if I'm running uh, multiple regression, uh, you know, what I would do is again run the uh, initial regression analysis um, and use the RVP plot in order to look at uh, the relationship between the residuals in each of the individual predictors and try to identify or isolate uh, where the heteroscedasticity may be coming from and then you can uh, determine from there which variables to include as weight variables in your analysis. So that uh, pretty well concludes this video presentation and I appreciate you watching.